All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to everybody who's joined us both here in the auditorium and uh, the many people who have decided to join us online. There's an online live stream of, of this event that's happening also. Uh, NYU Tandon is very pleased to continue our long running series uh, of open free cybersecurity lectures uh, that are now uh, being generously co-sponsored by AIG. So um, these lectures are also handled and sponsored by the center at NYU that I'm a part of, the Center for Cybersecurity, um, which I see many uh, students and, and others who are from that center here today. Uh, and we have four different events that are planned throughout the next year, including this event, which is actually our ninth event overall in uh, the series of events that we're doing. So uh, these lectures were originally funded via a grant from the Sloan Foundation. Over the past years, our lectures have been viewed by thousands of high-level representatives uh, in different businesses, government agencies, nonprofit, academic institutions, media organizations, um, and just by concerned members of the public. Uh, so this is um, a, you know, a way to get just broadly, broadly uh, smart about cybersecurity issues. And one of the things I personally really like about it is um, we have a series of very uh, knowledgeable people who also know how to speak in a way that isn't uh, purely crypto or uh, inscrutable tech terms to the average person. So there will be no, um, you know, no stack smashing or um, advanced mathematics dealing with cryptography. We'll uh, break it down to the important issues that uh, are, are with us today. So today's topic specifically is about how uh, democracy should function and how it should work uh, in the face of uh, cyber insecurity. And uh, this is so important, uh, as we all know today, um, due to uh, the different events that we see not only in our, in our own country, but across the world, where um, cyber insecurity and issues around this are drastically Im impacting a lot of the world's uh, democracies. So our expert lecturer, uh, Ed Amoroso, um, is going to be walking us through the intensity of cyber threats that impact our national, state, and local elections. Um, this cybersecurity lecture series is an in integral part of the program that we have here at NYU Tandon. Uh, our, our university here, let me say a little about this to kind of tell those of you who aren't familiar with NYU Tandon. Um, we have received a lot of honors uh, with respect to the educational program itself including three Center of Excellence designations from the National Security Agency and the United States Cyber Command. Um, we also overall realize that computer security is not purely a technology issue. So as a result, we've gone and partnered with a lot of other schools inside of NYU, including, for instance, uh, the law school, um, as, as well as uh, many other uh, different uh, groups here inside of NYU proper to uh, focus on tackling cybersecurity issues in a holistic manner. Um, that being said, our, uh, our um, uh, department and our center itself has a lot of people who are deep technology experts that have had tremendous impact uh, in the real world through the kind of research and efforts that they've done. Um, so, you know, we have uh, Nasser Memon, who's made uh, widely used digital forensics uh, software that's used by uh, law enforcement and, and other agencies across the world. Uh, there's uh, work that, that I've done on software updates, which is, is uh, used on pretty much um, every Linux device out there and is standardized and is the first security technology standardized for use in the cloud. It's used in automobiles, et cetera. Um, and we have experts like Damon McCoy, who uh, demonstrated the viability of, of uh, automotive hacking before others had done so, and also uh, was responsible for some um, really neat uh, interdisciplinary research that has resulted in a worldwide drop in the amount of spam that you guys have been receiving in your inboxes. Uh, so uh, our, our program overall, our educational programs include a cybersecurity master's degree, uh, which you can take not only here on campus, uh, but you can also take online. 
And we are very dedicated as a faculty of trying to uh, you know, educate and uh, prepare the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. Because one of the big things you hear time and time again is that there simply are not enough security experts out there for all the jobs that are available. Um, we uh, more recently offer a program that is the Bridge to Tandon program, uh, where what it does is it takes someone who maybe doesn't have a traditional computer science or certainly not a computer security background. Maybe they have a, um, a background in, in theater or they have a background in uh, psychology or some other field. And we provide them with a way to get the basic training they need to be prepared to enter into a master's program in uh, cybersecurity. Um, and we're accepting applications uh, uh, for this as well as the first cohort of a program that's a cyber risk and strategy master's degree, which is a joint program we're doing with NYU Law. Um, our, uh, the program NYU Tandon's online master's program, cybersecurity, was named the outstanding online program in the nation by the prominent online learning consortium and has won a, a other awards for this. So uh, I encourage you to check it out. It um, was something that for myself when I was looking for schools to, um, to come and be a professor at and on the market, I was uh, really impressed with the cybersecurity activity here, which is why I am standing here in front of you uh, today. Um, now, uh, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Tracy Griella. Uh, who's a global head of cyber at AIG, uh, our sponsor, and she's graciously offered to present our welcome remarks. Tracy is responsible for the company's cyber-related products and services, uh, ensuring AIG is creating uh, solutions and delivering expertise to help commercial and consumer insurance clients manage and mitigate evolving risk. She had previously served as global head of professional liability for financial lines for AIG, responsible for establishing underwriting strategy and implementing best practices in multiple lines of business, including cyber liability, reputational risk insurance, architects and engineers liability, and uh, specialty professional liability worldwide. Tracy began her insurance career with AIG in 1995 as a professional associate in AIG's US executive liability dis division and subsequently held a number of positions of increasing responsibility including president of national accounts, chief underwriting officer, and division president uh, for professional liability in the United States and Canada. Tracy is commonly called upon as an industry expert by insurance trade and mainstream publications on cyber liability and professional liability issues. She was named in 2015. Uh, she was named a 2015 insurance executive to watch by risk and insurance, uh, and a 2014 woman to watch by business insurance. So please, let's welcome Tracy up to the podium. Thank you. to welcome you to the NYU Cybersecurity Lecture Series. AIG is honored to be the official partner and sponsor for our four-part lecture series. We are pleased to kick off this series with the first lecture on Democracy Confronts Cyber Insecurity with Ed Amoroso. This lecture comes at a critical time in cybersecurity where the attackers have the advantage, state-sponsored and nation attacks are on the rise and our national security is threatened by cyber warfare. As a leader in cybersecurity insurance since launching uh, our cyber risk product in the late 90s, AIG plays an important role in the management of cybersecurity risk. Today we insure over 26,000 organizations across the globe and across all industries and for losses emanating from cyber attacks and over 20 million individuals for identity theft. We have significantly invested, we have significantly invested in increasing the awareness and education of organizations around the world, partnered with government agencies to promote best practices and have been a supporter of public and private partnership in tackling cyber risk. In the insurance industry, we're closely aligned with our clients objectives as we help them financially recover when cyber attacks occur. 
Partnering with NYU's expertise on one of the most thoughtful and distinguished events in the industry, reaching thousands of industry leaders globally, achieves our outreach objectives for educating industry, stimulating collaborative thinking, and focusing on practical strategies to address the impacts of the growing cyber risk. So we are grateful to have you join in our discussion today, and it's with great pleasure that um, we turn the stage over to, to Ed Amorosa. And Justin's, Justin's going to introduce Ed first. So uh, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Ed Amoroso as today's lecturer. He's going to probe uh, critical security risks to our infrastructure, survey how major political parties grapple with issues of cybersecurity, look back at previous presidential administrations and their security concerns, and offer advice on protecting our electoral systems from hacking. Um, Ed is a newly appointed distinguished research professor at NYU Tandon and at the Center for Cybersecurity. And he's teaching a course uh, entitled Introduction to Cybersecurity that's offered by NYU as well as Coursera. And this course explores advanced topics in cyber attack countermeasures, real time threat detection, and mitigation. He recently retired from ATT after 31 years of service, culminating as senior vice president and the Chief Security Officer of AT&T from 2004 to 2016. He's currently the CEO of TAG Cyber LLC, a global security advisory training, consulting, and media services company supporting hundreds of companies around the world. Ed has been an adjunct uh, professor of computer science at Stevens in Hoboken, uh, New Jersey for the past 27 years, uh, introducing nearly 2,000 graduate students to information security. He is also affiliated with the Applied Physics Lab Laboratory at Johns Hopkins as a senior advisor. He's the author of six books on cybersecurity and dozens of major research and technical papers uh, and articles in peer-reviewed and publications. He holds 10 patents in the area of security and media technology. He has served as a board member of the Board of Directors for M&T Bank, as well as on the NSA Advisory Board. His work has been highlighted on CNN, New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And Ed has worked directly with four presidential administrations on issues related to national security, critical infrastructure protection, and cyber policy. So let's all welcome Ed Amoroso. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And one more thing uh, before we get started, we want to give you a little quick. Oh, uh, shouldn't I get that afterwards? What if I'm just terrible? I won't get <laughs> the. Uh, Is this better? Home now. Thank you. Thanks Thank you very much. much. Sure. All righty. Well, thanks, thanks for coming. I want to thank the panel that's coming up later. Um, got an all-star panel. Tracy will join us as well. Um, we're going to talk some more about this topic. But let's start with something that I think all computer security talks should start with. Physics. So if you were going to do physics, like if you were dropped onto this earth and you could pick a time to be a physicist, what time would you pick? What era? I, I know what I'd pick. 1890 to 1930, right? About 40 years where I think just about everything that's been kind of cool that's, that we teach now in physics departments was invented. In fact, I'll bet you the classes taught here at NYU that are called modern physics, teach that period, right? It was almost 100 years ago, and it's still modern, so fresh. And what we saw in those 40 years was a lot of really cool ideas, followed by a period of about 10 years where we all got kind of introspective, right? Um, a lot of scientists started to reflect on what, what can all this physics mean in our world? And, and it culminated in the famous letter that Einstein wrote to Franklin Roosevelt. If you go into Washington, you go to Smithsonian, or like the Spy Museum, they have it hanging all over the walls there. You know, Einstein famously warning Roosevelt that the physics and a lot of the work activity that had gone on, the research that had gone on through that 40-year um, period could, ca could cause some problems. Well, I see clear, clear parallels I mean, the, the, let's, let's go back here and click on the chart here. Is there any way you guys can advance the charts from back there? This is, doesn't seem to be working. 
Yeah, doesn't work at all. It was working before, but those guys, right? That was the, the folks in, from 1890 to 1930 as Einstein and Madame Curie. That's a good place to be, right? If you're part of that group, that, um, that certainly is not a uh, bad group. But does anybody know what that group is? That's 1968, it's a NATO conference on software engineering. That was actually the date where software engineering was used the first time, the first time we ever saw that, that uh, term used. Um, and that was followed by about 40 years of some pretty amazing work, right? From 68 to 2008. That's a great time to do computer science, right? I mean, culminating in 2007, 2008, just about everything you use in the cloud now was invented around that time, right? So it's a pretty good time to be around. So that's been followed by the past 10 years or so, we've all gotten kind of socially aware of some of the problems that we may have created in the last 40 years, right? Um, it may very well be that um, parallels there are pretty significant. So it prompted me to write a letter to President Trump. Um, and I'll show you that later, where I'm trying to warn some of the concerns that I have about um, cybersecurity. So the lights just get br brighter in here? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Maybe you could dim those lights so we can see the charts up here. Um, so at any rate, here's what this talk is. I've been running around giving this talk, or versions of it. Here's what I do. I've been giving presentations for the last 30 years, and they're always these carefully laid out presentations that start somewhere and go somewhere, and I think it through and try and make it logical. And I got tired of giving logical presentations because cybersecurity is anything but that. So I came up with this idea of these little talklets, like a topic and then an answer, and I would jumble them all together, and I kid you not, I would randomly pull from them, make a presentation and call it a random walk, through cybersecurity, and I get up in front of a big group, and I would see the topics that I'd picked for the first time with you. Like I put the question and then the answer, and it was this big database of maybe 40 or 50 things that I'd done. So yeah, I wrote them, I knew what the answer was, but it was fun to see them. For this, I pulled some political ones, because we want to talk about democracy and kind of the effect of of you know, cyber security, and, and in this case, cyber insecurity, on democracy. So what you're going to see is you'll see a provocative question, and then my proposed answer to that provocative question. Does that make sense? But it jumps around a little bit, just like life, and just like cyber security. And you'll see that questions are things like this. So how can we prevent national election meddling? Now, here's one thing that I think people don't get when they, when, when they ponder the problems we, we deal with in computer security or computer science. Computing is man-made. These are engineered objects. This is not like natural science where you ponder the universe and we can, we can make claims about it, we can't change it. Like astronomers lay on their back on a hill and they look at all those little dots in the sky and they wish they could move them around but they can't to react to that. But in computing, we can actually go fix things we've built. Does that make sense to you? Like you don't have to just take it as a given that the internet or that computing or that software has to be responded to. Like we have nothing we can do about this. So the word prevent has become almost like a, a, a bad word anymore in cybersecurity. We don't talk about preventing things. We say, well, we got to assume that we're just going to all get hacked. There's nothing you can do about it. So everything's just respond to the problem. Do you agree that's a clear trend in cybersecurity right now? And I don't think that's right. So the question is, can we prevent meddling? And this is not a political statement. This is, how would you do it? Now, here's how I would start. I'd build a, a, a map like this. Now, look at each row. The top row, in some sense, is, is the, the collective belief structure, the collective understanding that comes to a country and its people from social media, from email, from websites, from all the different online electronic sort of barrage that we get. And that's very hackable. So the top row is something that someone who wants to meddle in an election could target. You agree? I mean, it's certainly one of the things you go, to, go after. Thing in the middle, 
the, the political parties, like the, the Democrats, Republicans, Independents, whatever, they have infrastructure, they have teams, they have systems, they have procedures, practices. You can hack that. That's a second row. And the bottom, that's the stuff in computing, like in computer science departments, we spend a lot of time on, like put a Diebold machine in front of me, can I hack it? Or the databases that are embedded with voter you know, information, can I somehow get in from a remote area and change the voting you know, via some sort of hacking? These are the three rows. So when somebody says meddling in an election, it's not, it's not one, it's sort of all or maybe some of these. You have to think of them all. It's not reasonable to just talk about one. So I'm going to give you what I think are the right answers for each of the top, these three rows. Let's start with something maybe you've seen before. Uh, it's called digital risk monitoring. In business, we have this new category of cybersecurity control where you pay a company or you do it yourself and you have this set of things you do. There's a bunch of companies. That's one of those uh, weird Forrester waves. Uh, Gartner does something like that where they rank companies. I'm, I'm not touting the what they've got there, but it gives you an idea that there's a lot of companies right now that do this. What they do is they troll around checking to see whether there's tampering with your brand, there's misuse of your message, there's people putting bogus stuff out about you. We need one of these for our country. Like why don't we have a big building on I Street, Washington called a National Digital Risk Monitoring Center and do this for all the different agencies and you know, political parties and so on. It seems so obvious to me. And yet when you go talk to agencies in Washington, they, in many cases, have never even heard of this. So there are businesses that do this now. There are businesses that sell to companies that know how to do this. And I think, you know, moving forward, we need to be trolling 24-7, looking for evidence of, of information that doesn't seem to be coming from a, an obvious place. Now, the middle thing, the... the political parties, I'll, I'll tell you more about them later, but when a candidate becomes viable, that guy shows up, right? And why is he there? To make sure the candidate doesn't get physically harmed. You want to explain to me why that guy doesn't show up to make sure that the candidate is not digitally harmed? Why don't, when you become a viable candidate, everybody turns in the cell phones, everybody turns in the PCs, no more managing your own infrastructure, let the Secret Service have the contract, probably run by NSA or something, let it be outsourced by professionals. You know who does IT security for the Democrats and Republicans? Your kids graduating from Georgetown in an N minus one election year. They go to work there, you graduate from Georgetown, and I believe there must be a rule that says if it's N minus one election year, you work for the Democrats or Republicans, you go there for one year, you become the IT security guy or gal, and then after the election, you go get a job somewhere on K Street. You work one year, you have no background in any of this. This is who does it. These are not stable jobs. They bloat up their team during elections, and then they drop down. They bloat up the team. That's what we're dealing with. It screams outsourcing. Why isn't, the, maybe not that guy, he doesn't look like he knows how to do what we do, but somebody like that should be running this. So that's the middle row. Bottom row, everybody knows those two. That's with Diffie and Ron Rivest. I'm actually friends with these guys. I've asked them both, what do you think about digital elections? What do you think about using cryptography? What do you think about using some of the modern tools? Like this is, if you don't know them, this is like Henry Ford and Thomas Edison of modern cryptography, right? These guys essentially invented the tools that we use now. Both of them said paper and pencil. That's what they told me. Now, I think they're being a little provocative and making a point, but I think that there's a message there, namely that ensuring that we can't cascade problems from one district, one community, one group to another should be the first requirement before we start upgrading the technology in any election infrastructure. Does everybody agree? What you don't want is cascade. That means I attack here and I can cause the attack to automatically propagate, say, across a nation. That's an absolutely unacceptable situation. So keeping things partitioned, keeping them local, and you know, their sort of joke, paper and pencil, means that before you go using a lot of technology, we better rethink this. And I know there's a lot of proposals around at the national level to just 
dump a digital infrastructure in place, and, and I'm not sure, at least these guys say it's not right. So let's get, recap. The top thing, digital risk monitoring, is something we should be talking about at the national level. The middle row should be outsource the IT and security and mobility for each of the viable candidates to teams that, are, that know what they're doing. And then at the bottom, we need to continue to distribute and keep things decentralized and local. Oh, here's one. What if the intelligence community hired Gartner? I, wa I want to show you this because it's a backdrop to democracy and insecurity. That's like a Gartner chart. I, I did this. The Gartner didn't do it. But you see the countries on the top there? They're all basically on record as saying they can break into anything, anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances. Pretty much, right? Um, look, I, I, I mean, go, go look it up. I mean, these are countries that are pretty unabashed in saying that they can do offense. What that means is that the current techniques that we use are not going to be sufficient. You can't target best practices now. We have to advance best practices. Does anybody disagree with that, right? It's not like there's a few companies or groups or countries that get it right, and if we could only be like them, we'd be in good shape. No, there's countries that can hack anything they want. And here's a problem. You know who Roger Bannister is? You know that guy, he ran the four minute mile? Before Roger Bannister runs a four minute mile, nobody can run a four minute mile. The instant he runs four minutes, everybody's running four minute miles after that, right? That's what I worry about with these nation state actors. When they demonstrate that something can be done, garden variety hacking groups, criminals, less capable nations say, oh, well, you, you can do it, I can do it. And it worries me every day, this concept that some countries seem to have no problem uh, breaking into whatever they want. Oh, here's a, here's a little minor question. So why couldn't the Russians find Hillary Clinton's emails? Now, I'm going to give you a computer science answer to this. It has nothing to do with politics or anything. We're going to talk computing. Now, first off, I think most of you know that a perimeter is not secure. Perimeter means that the computer down there in Australia gets hacked, and I have mutual trust across this big enterprise. With, see the one that sort of looks like it's sitting in Toronto? Like, Toronto is vulnerable if Australia gets hit. Does everybody agree? That's, the, that's what we hate about perimeters. You break one part of the enterprise, I can traverse the whole place. I get the whole place. That's how we read about these retail companies. Their point of sale terminals will hit, are hit because a vendor came in through a partner access gateway, and you go, huh? That's like Australia, and this is like Toronto, and how did that happen? Welcome to perimeters. Is there anybody in the room who disagrees that a global perimeter is not going to be a real secure way to do it? You'd like to do something else. So here, I'm going to do something now. I'm going to click, and you tell me if you hate this. If I see that server up in Toronto and I go, that's got some pretty sensitive stuff, ma'am. I'm worried about that. That's got our crown jewels. I think I'm going to do this. Anybody have a problem with that? That's called micro-segmentation. Half the cybersecurity companies on the planet are working on micro-segmented workload support, which means you take a piece of something and you move it. You break things up. Instead of having one big blob that I can hit, I break it into pieces and I try and coordinate them virtually. That's like computer security 101 right now from an architecture perspective. You're better with a distributed object than not. So this question of we went from that to that, when I show that to computer scientists around the world, they sit and they go, yeah, I think that's right. That makes sense. Isolate it from the, the perimeter. So what I say then is I go, all right, well, how about this? Here's the State Department. Let's talk a little bit about State Department. About 300 embassies and consulates around the world. And these are run by capable ambassadors and leaders, right? If you've ever met an ambassador, they're impressive people. I think if you're an ambassador for about five minutes, you're, ambassador, you're Madam Ambassador for Life. I'm pretty sure that, that's how it works. So these are people who have been appointed to be an ambassador at an embassy somewhere. And then off in Foggy Bottom, you have a bunch of NYU Tandon grads writing security policy requirements, like these wonky requirements, and sending them out to the ambassadors and the consulates and everything, saying, here's how we do security. You know, maybe they follow, maybe they don't. 
but that kind of thing is certainly not conducive to following it. And I was at a cocktail party not too long ago, and I met somebody who'd been working IT in a bunch of different embassies, and she told me a funny story. She said they had had a dignitary come to visit their embassy, and the dignitary had done something on YouTube. I don't know what it was, like a, a promotion for something they'd done, a charitable sort of thing. And there was a party, cocktail party, and then they were going to pop up the video on YouTube. All of you have been to a million receptions like that, right? Where you have your cocktail and somebody gets up and they go, oh, we want to welcome such and such. Let's watch this. And they show it. It's a nice charitable thing. Everybody claps. And it's real nice, right? The, it's, that's like Embassy 101 kind of thing. But they couldn't get the network working. And she's telling me, we're freaking out, we're freaking out. And finally, and she thought this was like a little joke, that it was clever. She said, we realized that we could snap into Wi-Fi from next door. And I went, wow, how clever. And she goes, yes, <laughs> it was great. Like everybody's filing in, we didn't know what to do. Thank God, we snap into Wi-Fi, we did the YouTube thing, it was great. If you're breathing Wi-Fi into an embassy from next door, why are you doing that? And how the hell is that signal getting in there, right? You get the point. These play, this is what the global state, of, it's a big perimeter, it's a global perimeter with some pretty scary places that are represented. So once one of them is hit, all of them are hit, right? And it's not just, I'm using them as an example. Why am I using them as an example? Well, let's put Mrs. Clinton's email, I put it in California somewhere. Now, with zero credit to them, I give them negative infinity credit for this, they had that, and they did this. And you just told me a minute ago that was a good security thing to do. And that's why the Russians don't have it. I'm, I'm guessing somebody somewhere is going, I swear we looked everywhere. It was isolated in some basement somewhere. Negative infinity credit to them for doing a security thing. I think by accident they did this. But here's why I highlight this. To my horror, I'm watching the debate and I'm worried as a computer scientist that the conclusion here is, that was bad, move it back in. No, it was good, leave it out, move more out, break the whole thing up. Does that make sense to you guys? That's the reason. A little interlude, my first hack at age 10. That's a gun shop near my house, in Jersey Shore. And if you share a generation with me, then you know that soda machines used to look like that, yeah. right? And I used to get my hand on the tip of that bottle. Remember you opened that vertical glass door? You could grab the bottle, but you couldn't get it out. I used to, when I was eight, I used to take a bottle opener and a straw and drink all the soda out. Okay, can botnets take out the internet? This is also, I, I put this in because it has some political implications. Everybody knows what botnet is. If you don't, my voice to your ears is a one to many relation. You all be quiet, it works great. I go, ah, and your ear hears that. Now, if I went, ah, and you could like direct all of your, that, ah, uh, at, you know, one of the folks sitting here, then they hear this big barrage of, ah, sounds like all of you are screaming at the one that's a one to many, many to one, old Smurf attack, and that's what botnets take advantage of. If your ear becomes this weird DNS or NTP-like amplifier, then I go, ah, uh, and you amplify it at him, and he's like getting barraged, botnet 101, right? And it always looks like this. All those little dots there are like my mom's computer. Um, my mother lives on Jersey Shore. When you walk in my mother's house, here's what you hear. Mm -hmm. And you go, Ma, what's that? She goes, oh, it's that stupid computer. And you go over and you go, Mom, Ma, why? She goes, no, 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 Eddie, do not touch my computer. Every time you kids touch my computer, it never works, right? And you go in and you just do a little bit of tapping around and you can see it's like infected, it's attacking China all day. And you're like, Mom, <laughs> she's on a Verizon Fios connection with like 10 meg out. And you're going, you sure you don't want to at least turn this off? No, Eddie, do not touch that. You know, I, she's a former school teacher, so she does her um, Excel spreadsheets on it. And she emails my kids and goes on like MarthaStewart.com. That's all she does. And her computer is one of the dots there, you know, playing along as part of a, a pretty significant bot. Now, let's do the math. 
Here's an old Norse screen. These uh, botnets make for the best visualizations, don't they? It's like whoosh, and it's not stuff going out, that's stuff coming in. Like it's all energy being sucked into a place. Here's the math. So if my mother's computer is using one meg outbound, that means the malware is generating outbound traffic, but it's being kind. My mom has a big Fios connection. She can still go on MarthaStewart.com, but it's always doing this, and that's why it's going mmm all the time. Like if your computer goes mmm, you got a malware on it, for sure. So take um, 1,200 bots in a botnet, which is so pedestrian, you don't even name that. Like, talk to me when you're at 50 or 100,000. You don't even name a 1,000 member botnet. That's nothing. But 1,200 of them at one meg, take out a 1.2 uh, pipe. How about down here, 100,000 at one meg, that fills up a tier one carrier's backbone, 100 gig. And how about a million, and we've all seen million member botnets, right? Conficker and a bunch of others. At one meg, that's the peering capacity of the United States. Terabyte, terabit per second. What do you think of that? Now for me, I'm like always freaking out about this. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this long time. I'm so worried about this. And, and a lot of people always tell me, come on, Ed, relax. You do this, so you worry about it. But there's people like in Washington or something must have this down, not knowing that I know that's not right. So I got a call a few years ago. You guys, um, Howard Schmidt, who passed away this past year. Howard invited me to go give a talk. He had been the, the first US cyber czar. And at the one year mark, he was having a party. And a, a little a talk like this, in a room about this big at the White House, he said, would you come give a talk? You know, I love your talks. I said, Howard, of course I'll come. So I go to the White House. He gets up, introduces me. I get up to the podium, and I'm talking about denial of service. And as I'm talking, I'm sort of looking in the front, and I'm pretty sure it's famous meet the press type people. And it's so funny how seven, eight years ago you didn't know, but now, like did I know who the Department of Education lead was five, my whole life? No, but now I know. You know, like we all know that somehow we're just part of our, no, but I didn't know. And while I'm speaking, Secret Service comes in and Obama walks in. And I'm going, whoa, like talk about denial of service. But they went like this, which I think means sit down. So Obama walks up onto the thing and I shake hands with him. And he gets over there and I sit right here. And there's Obama. And I'm going, I, I want to listen, but I'm thinking one thing. I got to have proof. I'm going to get home. My wife's going to go, how was your trip? Oh, it was nice. Nice to see Howard. Little indigestion on the train. Met Obama. A little bit of traffic coming up. She goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You met, so I need proof. So while I'm sitting here, I realize I have my iPhone in my pocket. So I figure, there's all Secret Service around. And everybody tells me that they, I'm sure they all reach for their guns as I did this. But I reach in my pocket, <laughs> take out my iPhone, and I go, Kuk. and there's Obama's butt. <laughs> right? And here, for the, you guys, that's Vint Cerf sitting there. I sent Vint the note, and I go, hey, look, that's you. He goes, yeah, we all laughed when you took that picture. You know? But the point is, Obama gets up and sort of finishes what I was talking about without looking at the paper. And I went, oh, I was hoping he would say it's all going to be fine. You know what I mean? Like, you, you grow up thinking they're Santa. And then you think, what well, you get in our world, and you go, ah, somewhere somebody's going to take care of this, I'm sure. I wish, like, this is still a problem. When I talk to grad students about this, they always raise their hand and they go, uh, Professor, and I go, yeah. you didn't give us the solution to this. And I go, yeah, I know. I go, well, welcome to graduate school. <laughs> so there really isn't one here. This is kind of frightening. It's frightening to me, because I think with IoT, with all these connected devices, these now are, are pretty good hosts for botnet attacks. And you know what's kind of cool? Here's a good midterm question. When is a child's toy like a nuclear power plant safety controller? And the answer is, 
when they're both bots and a botnet attacking something. Because the attacker, the child's toy is just as useful. Maybe not as big a connection, but who cares? All I need is a mag. I don't need that much. If your toaster is connected to the internet, then that makes a perfectly nice bot for my botnet to go after something. I need a million of them at one meg to fill peering capacity. And that's why when President Obama was speaking, and you know now with the President Trump, and, I, and I've known and met them all, and I'll tell you what, set the politics aside. Um, I posted a, a criteria that I'm working on with my friend Fran Moran, who's a graduate of NYU, did his poli-sci PhD here. He's a professor at Jersey City State College. He and I created a criteria for rating presidents in cyber. If you Google it, you can see my first uh, article about that. And I rate them all terrible. Like, I think they all have to work on kind of improving uh, the things. So you can look at that. But at any rate, let's uh, also original Clinton campaign fears about email security. This is a good one because when I'm showing this to grad students, they don't realize that that's the original Clinton campaign, right? That was Bill Clinton. And this was in 1996. So one score and six months ago or something, I got a call from one of those wonky kids working at the DNC. They'd been a student in my class at Stevens. And they said, hey, would you come talk to us? We have a problem. And I went, OK, what's the problem? And she says, well, at the DNC, we have this building, and then we have this other building, those two, DNC and then Fairchild building. And she said, we're worried that we saw that there was like this T1 connection. That's what you had then, a T1. It was a tele telecommunication circuit switch connection. We're worried. We saw this guy from telling us we had a T1 connection between the buildings. We're worried that the T1 wire that goes under the building and under the road connecting the two buildings. If you do telecom, you're cringing already, right? That's not how telecommunications works, but she's telling me this. She says, we're worried that the Republicans are going to come with a shovel because, look, there's a dirt patch. See the, the black line here? That is that. See the black line? I tried to trace it, but there's like this dirt here. It's like a baseball infield. And they're telling me, they're worried the Republicans are going to come like, oh, you know, and dig it up and put like a listener there. And could I show them how to put encryption at either end of this wire going under the road? And I'm going like this. Like, what? And again, you know, these are kids. They're out of school. So I go, yeah, I'll, I'll come. I'll come down. So look, most of you are grown-ups in here. If they say, show up Tuesday morning at the Fairchild building, what time are you showing up? 8.30? That's when a grown-up shows up, right? So I take the train. You know, it's a pain when you got to take that real early metro liner, and you're going, I go over there. In those days, it was a taxi. You take a taxi over, I get out. I go in the Fairchild building, I walk in, and it's one of those slate floors with that thing on the wall that says, Suite 101 obstetrician, suite 104 pediatrician. It was like that. I don't know if it still is, but then, like, suite 106 Democratic National Committee. I go, 106. Now, would you knock on the door? Do you knock on the pediatrician's door? I don't. So I go, and I walk in. It's dark. And I go, flip the light on, and I sit down, which is what you would do. And I'm thinking, so I sit there. There's nobody around. I kid you not. And I wrote about this in a book. I'll show you the page from a book to prove it really happened. A guy comes in in a bike. You know those weird bike things people wear, that like the tight, uh, short things? With <laughs> he comes in. He's got the bike, and he goes, hey, dude. And I go, hey, dude. And he brings the bike in. Not, who are you? He brings the bike out. Later, dude, I go, see you later. He goes out. Door closes. The UPS guy comes, and I'm like, I don't work here. I'm not signing for a package. So I'm thinking, what is this? I did what you would do after an hour. I got bored, and what do I find? That. 
It's a router. Here's how you break a router in case you don't know. Turn it off, turn it on, hit control B. And that breaks the sequence, the reboot sequence. Anybody who's ever worked in a data center knows when the router's messed up, you turn, I mean, when my wife asked me to fix her computer, I go, oh, I'll do something really carefully thought out. When she's not watching, turn it off. Turn it on, it usually works then. But you turn the router off, turn the router on, on, you hit control B, it interrupts the boot sequence. You look for the manual that says password recovery. Yeah, there's the control B up there. You execute those commands, and then you're telling the router to come up without asking for a password. You're writing a you're turning a zero to a one in a status word, so you're writing a hex number to the router. And then it'll say, now for security, um, what would you like the new password to be? And you put in a password, and I'm in the room there, and she was worried about the digging up and the encryption and the Republicans. So what do you think I, I recommended? How about we fix email security? And I wrote about it in a book. I really swear to God it happened. Can you imagine if they had fixed email security 20 years ago? There are consequences to bad security management decisions. You blow it today, it may not get you tomorrow, but it's going to get you. You make a bad security management decision, eventually, you've got a lot of experts who are going to jump up here on a panel in a little bit, tons of experience. You guys would agree, right? Bad decision. It's going to get you sooner or later. may not get you the next day, but it's going to get you eventually. Should private citizens, this is my last little zotnet, and then we'll go through some questions that you may have. We don't get a lot of this. Private citizens, I don't, advise, I don't think they advise presidents enough. Who's that guy? Come on, somebody impressed me by shouting out his name. I walk by his college all the time in lower Manhattan. That's Bernard Baruch. He's an awesome guy. If you haven't read his story, what an amazing guy. A multimillionaire, a financier. He ran a bunch of different commissions for several presidents. But that's a picture of him in Lafayette Square. And the press loved it. Because there's Bernard Baruch. Look at that guy. Central Casting sent him to sit on that chair and glance out at the president. Isn't that a great image? I love that image of him. I think somebody may have even created like a little monument or something. If you go to Lafayette Square, there's a plaque there, right? Yeah, like, um, you walk into the main entrance of the building, there's a statue. That thing. That thing. With, it's a bronze statue. Right, it's a bronze statue. That, that, that's Bernard Brook. It's a great concept. And I always think, what happened to that? And, and this, too. Is that, there's the letter that Franklin Roosevelt wrote, um, or received from um, Einstein. So like I said, I wrote one. I was like, said, I, I mean, all right, he doesn't get Einstein, but you know, Trump is not Roosevelt, so we're, maybe we're even or something, I don't know. <laughs> um, here's what I told him. And this is sincere, this is what I really believe to be right. I think that it's clear that the present administration believes we should have less compliance and regulatory infrastructure. So why don't we just make NIST the one requirement? Is anybody opposed to that? Maybe consultants who make a bunch of money on all the different compliance soup that we deal with. But I've been begging them, why don't we just make the NIST framework, which is pretty good, it's comprehensive. And if you don't like it, then augment it with what's a little different. Like there's PCI, and there's every state has their own, and there's GLB, and there's ISO, and there's this, NIST, and there's more and more and more, it's all these frameworks. So a typical company, the people who will be on the panel here, ask them, and they'll tell you that big teams that just run GRC tools to keep track of all these frameworks. If you go get your house inspected, or if you're buying a house and you're getting an inspector to give you a punch list of things to fix, do you do it 27 times? No, you do it once and you do it right. So I beg them, please, Let's do this. The second thing I said was the enterprise perimeter is evil, and we should, uh, agency heads should be explaining to us how they're going to divest themselves of, a of their perimeter. And if they can't understand the question, then that's a pretty good hint that maybe they need some help, or they need to be replaced, or whatever. And then the third one is the one I've made the biggest deal about. We do not have a viable cyber core program right now in the United States. We have it in pieces. 
It's little bits and pieces, and it's run by people who are really trying to do it right. We need Sergeant Shriver's like granddaughter or something to run a real cyber core program where we get the Fortune 1000 or something to help fund it. Like, I, is there a Fortune 500 company that wouldn't chip in a couple million dollars here? Then not, absolutely. And if the universities all agree to maybe make the tuition kind of reasonable, we could have 30 or 40,000 fresh youngsters go right into civilian government and also into industry. Here's the problem. World War II, like you know the image we have World War II, where the front line is the military, and behind the military, Rosie the Riveter and Ford Motor Company retooling to make war equipment and young kids gathering up materials and buy, buy, buying war bonds. It was, it was the community supporting the military, the government. Now it's reversed. Now IT security teams are on the front lines of the cyber war and it's government behind them propping them up, giving them this, fining them by the way, which I think is a terrible idea, but you know, doing whatever they got to do to try and help industry, it's reversed. So the cyber core program should be injecting young people pay for their four years of school, four years not at NSA or DOD, but at an insurance company, at a, the, the Social Security Administration, you know, divvy amongst the, the front lines. And I think you probably could get that funded by, by industry. So these are the three things I've sort of been begging the team. I, I did connect up with them and had a nice discussion. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic, I think, you know, again, from a purely a political perspective, I think that this probably in the next few years is the time we should be doing something. And, may, you know, maybe some of the folks there will do it. We'll see. It's up to all of you, the computing community. We, I think we are the most substantive community that, in my mind, is largely apolitical. Right? Most of our worldview is not around the politics, but more about, like, here's what we make fun of. We make fun of Luddites, don't we? Like, it's... It's us, people who appreciate and we're inventing the future, and we, we get technology, we love it, we know that there's wonderful, and then there's everybody else. Right? <laughs> so, so our worldview is that, and I think we need to stick together as a group, and I think those things I showed you earlier, NIST is one compliance framework, virtualize away from your perimeter, and let's inject a lot of young people right into the front lines. That's what I, that's what I wrote, and that's what I really fundamentally believe is the best way for our democracy to find its way out of some of the problems that we've seen the last couple of years. So with that, I'm happy to take a few questions that you guys might have. I don't know if we're just going to do it informally with hands. I think that's probably what we'll do. Um, why don't we start in the back? If you could say name and where you're from, that'd be great. We can all hear. Sure. I'm Edward Gibson from Eastern One. And I'm asking about the uh, utility of uh, blockchain as a way to help pr um, provide security in distributed systems and I, with the IoT on the rise. Okay, so he's Thank asking you. about blockchain. But blockchain's a pretty amazing concept as a data structure. For those of you who don't know how blockchain works, if you've ever heard of a hash function, then you know that if I take data and I run it through a hash function, I get a number. Does everybody agree with that? You know, hash function, you, it takes a variable length input, produces a fixed length number. Now, if I put another number on top of that, and I spin it and keep, keep changing that number with this text until I get an output that has some pattern I've decided ahead of time. I want it to be like four zeros as the beginning of that hash. Might take me an hour, might take me five minutes, might take me three days, but eventually I get that and then I leave that number there. Now I move to another block, I do the same thing and I get the same pattern. What's really the magic of blockchain is if I take this number, the output, and I feed it into the next hash and spin that dial until I get a number in the right pattern, take that output, feed it into the next one, and so on. That's blockchain. Now that is a data structure that is magnificent. It was invented in the 70s, right? Walt Tuval, all those geniuses at IBM who did Luf Lucifer that became Des. That's where blockchain came from. It's not like it was invented yesterday. But when you look at that, you say this is awesome because if somebody goes back and mucks with this data, it messes up the number, which then messes this up, and all the way down, 
So if you mess this up, I got to start here and go, ah, I got to go all the way back here and redo this called mining. Run that through, fix that. And by the way, it'll be a different number that if I've got distributed, like a distributed tree of blockchains, then it'll immediately see I mucked with it. But let's say you didn't. Then I have to do this one and catch up and you'll never catch up. So it's a wonderful data structure. But what worries me is it reminds me of PKI. You know, we, we call PKI beautiful stuff. Half of our lectures are all on PKI. You'll probably do some PKI later in this room, right? Um, PKI is the authentication technology of the future, and it always will be. You know that joke? I think blockchain is the solution to everything of the future, and it always will be. Um, so it's good, yeah, I use it. Does it stop hacking? No. Does it make audit trails, distributed audit trails smoother? Yeah, so use it for that. But it's not going to stop nation state hacking. But it is nice data structure. Most people don't know how it works. That's why I took a minute there to show you what, what it really is. Um, is there a runner? Yeah. Um, you guys will be next. I'm Shikhar. I'm a student here at NYU. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think, like, how much can AI or data science really influence cybersecurity? AI? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, if you have copies of Donald Knuth's books, which I hope you do, then you learn that algorithms are really built from primitives, right? Like, as computer scientists, we don't have a periodic table, but we have some primitives. Sorting is one. Searching is one, matching is another. We have all these things we know how to do as computer science. Artificial intelligence introduces new primitives, labeling being the obvious one. Here's the problem. The popular media sees artificial intelligence. They go nuts, just like all new sciences go nuts. The original purpose of mathematics had numerology in there. And you had to like go, eh, all that stuff about predicting the future. I don't think so. Let's keep calculus, but I think we'll lose the numerology stuff. And then astronomy. Eh, this astrology stuff doesn't look right to me. Let's get rid of that predicting and guess and doing magic. How about chemistry? Well, alchemy and potions, maybe we push that aside. And by the way, we can't assume that just because you get sucked into all that, you're a dummy, because the greatest alchemist of all time, Isaac Newton, he did. Let's see, I think I'll do calculus and physics, and in the middle I'll mix up some potions and be an alchemist. That's his life. So when I hear Elon Musk and all these other guys talking about computers thinking and taking over, I say they don't, they're wrong. It's not. Dijkstra's comment, the question of whether computers can think is akin to asking whether a submarine can swim, is, is right, right? So AI, the way we all talk about it, is, is not going to make much difference to the cybersecurity equation other than introducing beautiful primitives for machine learning that allow us to say instead of here's a cat, 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 have you got that? Now go look for cats. It's good thing. Now our new primitive is here's a malware variant, here's a variant, here's a variant, there's a variant. You got that? Go look for variants and it works. Like that's, that does work. Does that change all of computing? No but it's a nice way to apply a new primitive to the problem. So we have to factor the alchemy out of AI, and what you're left with are new Knuth-like primitives that help us solve problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, since you brought up, I went down to the DNC one time in the- The Democrats. Yeah, yeah uh, 1996, because my wife wanted to see Bill Clinton, so I made a contribution. But it's, it's human incompetence. I gave them a check, and they never found it. They, I mean, they, she went there, but fortunately, they never cashed the damn check. Uh, another time, after 9 How much did you write it for? <laughs> Clinton victory, 96 so like or something. Like 100 bucks or something? No, but they, they, had, they checked in New York. They said, yes, they received the check, but that was, uh, they had too oh, much boy. money. Then in, uh, Too bad we didn't have PayPal then, right? Yeah, and then... Uh, uh, I guess I went down to the visit somebody in the Senate office building one time. This was after 9-11, I thought, and Same. their security in the Senate Same. office building is less than Bell. just going into NYU. Yeah. So, and then all this, you talk about NSA, but they don't, you know, with Bradley Manning and or Chelsea Manning and yeah. uh, Snowden and so on, and they keep losing stuff at some guy 
putting stuff in Fort Meade and in his garage recently. I asked uh, General Hayden about this uh, uh, last year. He said there's no accountability. And I guess he informed me because I saw that somebody, uh, it's those heads at the bottom level, none at the top. And he told me, I guess it's essentially for protocols and so on. He said committees do it. So I guess only a committee takes responsibility, which means nobody does. But in other words, these are all human. You're right. And, uh, you know, we can get RSA and so on. We can do it mathematically. I think we can, defense is way ahead of, uh, of offense if you want to. But uh, I think everything you said is right. I mean, every, I assume everybody heard the, the litany of some real problems. I think you've summarized pretty accurately some of the issues that uh, are rooted in human beings making some mistakes. I would agree with that. Good points. Uh, Witten, ooh, geez. Uh, why do you think Witt and Ron were joking when they said, do it in pencil and paper? We are introducing technology into a system yeah. that is built around taking a slow and methodical process for no real appreciable benefit. I, I, no, I agree with you totally. I was just, um, the joke part was just pencil and paper would be a step back from where we are now, right? I mean, so it's the manual part, I, I, you're right. I, that was the part I thought was the joke. Like, you're not going to go back to people writing with pencil and paper. But um, that's pretty shocking, isn't it? It, it, it was to me. Because I know as a computer scientist, I spend one or two lectures every semester teaching youngsters how you apply the beauty of public key cryptography to real problems in our world. And look, you... you the fact that there's no Kmart anymore in the strip mall tells you that you know it works for commerce, right? Like embedding a public key certificate from a CA in the browser is genius because that means you and I can buy a book and do nothing. We just click, we buy a book, it's awesome. But the idea that we would do the same thing to vote, man, it seems like that should be a logical progression from that, right? And to have the two of them suggest we still need more, th more thought. And it's all about infrastructure, right? It's never about the mathematics and about the keys and toolkits. That's never the issue. It's always the registration, the infrastructure, the support, the weird edge cases. So look, I, are we going to get that fixed? Yeah, probably. But just right now, the two greatest cryptographers I know are saying we still need to do some work there. So if you're a grad student and you're doing work in crypto, to the degree that you can incorporate some thought and some research into the mundane part of administering infrastructure around public key technology, that's largely, you probably don't have a lot of grad students coming knocking on your door saying I want to do an administrative problem in public key, but I think we need more kids doing that, doing research in that area, because we have very weak uh, infrastructure. Good point. Good evening. Um, I'm a student at NYU, of course. Um, I'm writing a thesis and I titled it Cyber Insecurities because I don't think so it is secure. But my question right now arises is, you know how we have 911, what's your emergency? Don't you think we should have a number like a cyber police? When, <laughs> like seriously, yeah, like, maybe. it can all be idea. done. There's no cops, no ambulances, nothing. Everything is online. 011, call that number, I've been hacked or my account has been stolen, what do I do? They track your IP address, they shoot it, who, who has access to it, they stop it. Maybe, yeah, give them a little jingle or something. Right? Because yeah. all of this that we are thinking is yeah. out there, it's like global, it's democratic. It like a dial 911, you have an emergency dial. Right, you know, zero, one one zero, zero 011 would make sense, kind of binary, right? right. Like zero 011 if zero you one have one a computer one. problem. Right? <laughs> oh. Yeah, it can be zero one one. I, I get, uh, oh, it one is? zero one maybe would work. One zero one would okay, actually be two one cool, one. Right? I don't know. Yeah. All I'm I saying is. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure everybody in the room here would be able to make, including yourself, a list of pros to something like that and a bunch of real serious challenges to something like that. It would be one of those where you could make up a lot of, either, like if you and I got on either side of a debating table, and you said, I'm against doing something like that, and here's why. And I say, I'm for doing something like that, and here's why. I bet you we have balancing arguments. You know, that would be hard to do. Not a bad idea, though. Because I feel the end user is a common person like me. Right, right. 
and we have absolutely no education. Yeah. We are handed this shiny, beautiful iPhone 10. We have absolutely no idea how to Did use it. How to, no, I will not. Yeah, kind of expensive, I'm sticking right? to iPhone 6, <laughs> so for now. But I just feel as if we need to teach the kids at home, the three-year-old, no they have access, that. but there's nothing taught about how to secure yeah. what you have. One thing I will say, though, is the two great, like on awareness, we need to do it. But what are the two greatest awareness campaigns of all time? Don't smoke, wear a seatbelt. And right now, the National Safety Council says something like 15% of drivers don't put a seatbelt on. And it's something like that in the US for people who still smoke. If you go to Europe or Asia, it's higher. So if you can't get people to follow don't smoke and put a seatbelt on, saying we want to make you aware that you should do these administrative procedures with your computer, seems like we're going to have less success than those two, which, when well, we should do it, though. I mean, it, instead of having a problem this big, we'll have a problem this big. I'll take the latter any day of the week, but it's never going to get to this through awareness. It has to be technology. That's a good idea. Why don't you do that? Do that as an NYU Tandon startup. Do it there. Yeah, it's a good idea. Thanks for entertaining questions. Is it, am I Can next for the question? Oh, yeah. Thanks no, for entertaining sorry. questions. My name is Josh Reisman. I'm in, I enjoy the, the business conversation around cybersecurity. In the beginning, you mentioned from a physics and engineering point of view, if we created something, per, and I'm going to paraphrase, maybe we ought to be able to control it. Uh, with your open letter to the government, I'm not worried about what it takes for that bureaucracy, but let's say a, a large financial institution it's a business decision with trade-offs of we recognize this as a risk and what do we do with it, which maybe that's part of the cyber insurance versus mitigate versus accept the risk, but what's your perspective on what it takes for a business or a board to say, we realize this is potentially a bet the company risk. On the other hand, there are people who would say a control shouldn't cost more than its benefit and we're already spending way more than we thought. I mean, do you have an opinion on well, that? And, and is that the, relevant? Well, let's go, comment on the general risk management issue and tell me if this is what you're thinking. Thanks. But uh, any C-suite or board or whatever needs to think about risk. And where you want cyber to be, you mentioned banking, let's take that sector. You want cyber to get to where bank robbery is. Like if, you're, if you sit on a bank board, and I have, you know that there's a lot of bank robberies, a surprisingly high number of bank robberies. I don't know if anybody's spouse or maybe somebody here knows a teller. Um, it's pretty terrifying when that happens. And banks recognize that there's not zero bank robberies. When was the last time you woke up in a cold sweat about bank robbery? Never. And do you, before you open a checking account somewhere, so tell me about how you stop bank robberies. You never. And I'll bet that if you went through the New York Times the last two years, I'd be surprised if there was more than a brief mention, if that, a bank robbery. That's where cyber should be. It's never going to go away. People have to worry about it, keep worrying about it. But we have the gap is way too big now. And what boards and C-suites need to do is narrow the gap, not expect it to be zero. Like as we're all talking to boards, one of the main messages is we have to make sure they understand that it's silly to say, get rid of all this risk. You guys would all cringe and go, Come on. That's just like bank robbery, you can't say, get rid of it, make it never happen. Not going to never happen. But I think I can get it, and we should all focus on getting cyber. To, is that a reasonable analogy? Yeah, that's a good analogy. That's great. Yeah, I think that's our. We have time for yeah. two more. I think they're already queued up right. with the mics. We're here. Yep. Uh, so you mentioned earlier, sorry, my name is Alad. I'm an ex-student here, and I, I now run IT audit for a company called Alliance Bernstein. I'm trying to understand. You mentioned that we should have pros uh, that are handling this and not just let you know uh, college kids uh, handle the security for elections. I think that's right. So who are the pros? Because the NSA has basically endangered the world by like leaking data with Snowden, and the, you know the shadow broker like leak was pretty bad. The <laughs> FBI directors are telling us to weaken encryption. And we've got the CIA who I can still see data dumps on WikiLeaks on a daily basis. So who do I actually turn to that will give me you know, sufficient advice on how to actually secure these types of things? Uh, graduates of the NYU Tandon. There you go. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Boy, you threw that one and tossed that one up for me now. Uh, you know, it's like anything. I can tell you when somebody is clearly not capable to do it. 
and I can tell you when somebody clearly is. It's where you draw the line, and you're right. It's not as simple as saying, oh, you got CSP, you have five years experience, you can pass this test, good, you're an expert. Doesn't work that way. But, but I think we know when it's not right. And my observation is that the way the political parties now manage cybersecurity, like, look, the poster child for just terrible, terrible cybersecurity was John Podesta, right? I mean, when we're doing awareness campaigns and we're, t he's always the example that comes up. Sending notes to associates about changing passwords over clear text email, really? You know, things like that. Reusing the same password in a lot of different places, really? So if, for example, a government agency had been managing mobility for that group, there's no way that would be allowed. That just would not have happened. It cannot happen. Like at AIG, it's not gonna happen. There are controls around that. Is it perfect? No, but that isn't gonna happen. So I think you can see when there's a group that clearly can't do it. You can see when there's a group that clearly can. And then in the middle, judgment call. Does that make sense? I answer your question. Ask again if I didn't. No, I understand. They may not be the poster child for how you do this. I think you have to, you have to do something that, that ensures that you've got some of the best minds doing this. There are some people pretty good at cyber defense. They do exist. But how do you think someone like that? If you're, you're, most of these things are international, right? You don't need laws to stop a big person. You don't need laws to stop a cyber attack. You need laws to capture the ones that are recently. Oh, I understand. No, I'm just saying that here, here's my, my life's pursuit. Like from now until the time they take my computer away from me is around building defenses that stop cyber attacks without the silliness of asking the other guy to please stop hacking. Like if you're a CISO, or if you're, let's say you're interviewing for a CISO position, and I'm interviewing you for the job and I say, what's the best way to get somebody to stop hacking or how do we, the answer should be, you can't call them and ask them to stop hacking. You have to build a defense that makes what they want to do not work. And most of the discussion I see like on television blames somebody and a is asking them to stop. And I go, have we forgotten all our computer security here over the last 25 years? You don't ask a hacker to stop. And the idea that I can catch you and throw you in jail doesn't play in a nation state context. I know you should do that. Got uh, Austin later has a uh, background at the Stop. FBI. You'll hear from him. Absolutely, can catch somebody, get them, put them in jail, throw the key away. I'm for that, but that shouldn't be your defensive strategy. That should be a complementary thing that you do. We are computer scientists. We can prevent because we built the things that are vulnerable. We can redesign them. If you're an electrical engineer and you build a circuit that doesn't work, do you build incident response circuitry? around it so that when it breaks, you can respond to it? You're laughing because it's ridiculous. I know sometimes you have to do. There are cases. Circuit breakers, circuit breakers do work like that, but you, you would agree that if there's a fundamental problem in a circuit, your, your instinct is not to do incident response around it. And one of the problems we have in cybersecurity, I'll make the last comment and we'll, we'll move on. We do have a lot of astronomers that come to cybersecurity and natural scientists and I think they forget that we're not dealing with natural phenomena. It's engineered systems that we built. We can go change them. We don't have to say, like the internet, a map of the internet looks like a map of the sky, doesn't it? And the astronomer laying there looking at the stars going, oh, I'll map them all, I can't do anything. When they come to computer science, they look at the internet, they go, oh, we gotta respond to that, and you go, hey, dude, I can change that. And they go, you can't change that, the star. And you go, no, it's the internet. I can, I, these are computers, networks, we can change it. We can redesign it, we can rebuild it. And they go, oh, that's not what I learned. And I go, well, I know, this isn't physics, this is computer science. That makes sense, like you can, you can actually go redo this stuff. I don't know if we have any more time or if we're... One more. Are we, are we Very last more? question. Uh, Gabriel Lavgerinos from Energy Mentors International. Thank you for a thought-provoking talk. Uh, my concern is, and I'd like your comments as to how much has the current government, but more importantly the immediate past government, done about protecting against cyber attacks on our 
power generation system power. and mass transportation and electricity on off because uh, the concept of decentralization has not yet occurred in my industry to the extent that I would like it to be. In other words, break it up, small pieces. Rather than having large, huge, vulnerable places of attack, have three, four of them I agree with that, that are more point. efficient. Totally agree. That's the way. But have we been going in that direction in terms of cyber attack protection, or nobody's worrying about well, it? Well, I'm not an expert in the power industry, but one thing I will say is that it's got to be an industry government cooperative, right? Because if the problem we have now, unlike in World War II, where the government could say, hey, we're going to just move the front here, we're going to attack here, we're going to plan this attack and do it. Now it's industry, and it's not so easy for government or anybody to say, hey, we're going to do the following, because maybe it makes no economic sense, or maybe the, you know what I mean? Yes, so yes. it's a trickier problem because of the government industry thing. And we're also parking a lot of stuff on the cloud. We're, park we're central yeah. parking things that are. Well, one thing about cloud, I will say, Let's say you are a, um, a, a, a power company and you're worried about moving things to cloud. The one thing to keep in mind is that you as a power company are running a network that's accessible by your third parties and your customers. You are the cloud. Like to people who work with you, you're a cloud provider. So you might say, I hate the cloud, but guess what? That's what you are. I mean, I log into you. I'm a third party. I come into a portal. So the question is, can you do it better than Microsoft? or Amazon, and if the answer is, yeah, definitely, then I go, dude, fine, go for it. But if you go, no, I could never do it as well as them, then maybe you should move there, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's such a b basic, duh, sort of question. We are all in the cloud. NYU.edu is a big blob of cloud computing. I log in from home. I connect into NYU.edu, and I do stuff. And it's no different to me then when I'm connected up to Office 365, right? They're both just a big blob of computing that I connect up to. So if you can't do it better than a cloud provider, let them do it. Great, well let's thank Ed again. <laughs> so uh, we're now gonna have a 10 or so minute break. And following that, we'll have our forum where you guys will have a chance.
Yep. Yeah. Very well. Okay, great. Yeah. to, you know, kind of prevent
check. That's so strange. Oh, that's nicer. Okay, um, so now we're ready to uh, resume again. Uh, I think, you know, Ed, of course, gave a great talk uh, earlier, but one of the most interesting things about coming to these talks and being able to participate in these is to uh, hear um, the audience questions and be able to respond and, and, you know, get the burning things that you've been thinking about on your minds answered by a panel of experts. So in addition to Ed and Tracy, who we met earlier, um, we have uh, uh, three other experts on, on the stage here. Uh, we have Austin Bergwis. Uh, Austin is co-head of managed services and incident respond at, response at Blue Team Global. We have Mike Higgins. Uh, Mike is chief information uh, security officer of NBC Universal. And we have Rick Howard, who's chief security officer of Palo Alto Networks. I'll just give you a little bit more information about each of their backgrounds. <coughs> So Austin's the co-head of Managed Services and Incident Response at Blue Team Global, a newly formed advanced threat intelligence and management managed services company. Uh, previously, he was the uh, he was senior managing director and head of K2 Intelligence's cyber defense practice. Drawing on his deep leadership experience in counterintelligence, national security, cyber criminal investigations, and incident response. He leads a team focused on advising global clients across all sectors of cybersecurity and cyber defense, providing managed services, incident response, and proactive services. Uh, Mike Higgins here. Mike is a veteran security executive with almost 30 years of experience in commercial and federal government roles, as founder of the DOD uh, Computer Emergency Response Team, or DOD CERT. I think you guys very likely know it. He was one of the earliest advocates in the leadership role of the federal government uh, through the identification of uh, the five critical infrastructures. He's also a former chairman and early member of the internationally recognized Forum of uh, Incident Response and Security Team, or FIRST, as you may know it. Um, Rick Howard is Palo Alto's Chief uh, Security Officer, Palo Alto Network's Chief Security Officer, where he has overall responsibility of the company's internal security program, uh, leads the Palo Alto's Threat Network Intelligence Team, which you may know as Unit 42. Yeah. He, he directs the company's efforts on uh, the Cyber Threat Alliance, information sharing nonprofit, uh, hosts the Cybersecurity Canon Project, and provides thought leadership for the company and the cybersecurity community at large. I'm glad Let's you give changed. A round of applause for all of our panelists. I'm glad you corrected that because uh, our marketing guy would have been really mad at me if you just said Palo Alto. We get yelled at all the time. It is Palo Alto Networks, okay, just so you know. Okay, <laughs> okay great. Um, so let's, uh, uh, since I am the forum moderator, I get the pleasure of uh, starting us off with our first question. Um, so the first question I have is for Austin. So Austin, uh, how should we bring nation state actors to justice? Just like that, <laughs> magically. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's complex, and, and my background uh, uh, was prior to, prior to being uh, uh, at K2 Intelligence and the Blue Team, I was uh, in the FBI for, for quite some time and, and, and ran the, the New York's uh, cyber program uh, and had plenty of experience trying to chase uh, Criminal hackers, uh, hacktivists, and 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 nation state bad guys down. Um, look, to attribution is is not the easiest thing to do. It takes two pieces to put attribution together, and that's um, a solid understanding and confidence in the indicators of compromise. That's the IP address and the domains that's associated with the attack. And then second, it's it's the the techniques and procedures of the TTPs. 
that are associated so that if we see attacks coming in from, um, from a specific domain or IP and it's, they're using uh, brute force attacks or they're using SQL injection or they've got signature in the malware, we can, we can put those two together and raise the confidence level to, to attribute the attack to a certain nation state. Um, actually, actually getting to the person behind the keyboard is, is something even harder. And that's, uh, and, 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 and you're probably reading in the papers over the past couple of years, the, the, the government is, is actually being quite successful in at least naming and shaming or indicting these folks from the, from the Chinese hackers a few years ago to the more recent uh, Russians that were associated with the Yahoo hack. Um, that is all based on the collection capabilities from the NSA specifically, and also from domestic collection uh, of the FBI. It's the visibility that we see globally, uh, seeing the, uh, the, the uh, transmissions and the attack vectors of these nation states. And uh, when, when Ed in his talk was talking about botnets and the compromising of, of his mother's computer, that's the same way that the FBI gets visibility into, into those compromised computers. We identify a compromised computer, oftentimes it's a tipper from the NSA. We go knock on that individual's door, or the FBI does, and, and asks for consent to monitor just the trespasser data. It's called the trespasser exception to the law and all you need is consent. And once uh, you gain consent, now the FBI has visibility into oftentimes the communications between the adversary. So if someone in China was looking to attack uh, Citibank, they wouldn't go and connect directly to Citibank, they go through multiple hops. And if the FBI is on those hops and the NSA is on those hops globally, now we get to see the entire pathway all the way to Citibank, see them drop tools, see them communicate. Oftentimes they're passing passwords, um, passing passports, uh, emails, identifiable, identifiable information, and that's oftentimes how you get to the person behind the keyboard. Can I jump into that though? Because Ed mentioned this during his talk, right? Most of us don't need to do that, right? Network defenders don't need attribution to be successful at preventing material impact to your organizations. I don't care. Right, uh, they get you two percent of the solution. What you really need to do is put all those prevention controls that Ed was talking about in place and make sure that's working. There's really two kinds of cybersecurity intelligence groups. There's government intel, right, and they're trying to influence nation-state activity, right, to fulfill some government goal. But for the rest of us in the commercial sector, okay, we're just trying to keep bad guys out of our network, and I definitely don't need to know that it's Sam from China hacking me. It's just not not re not relevant. Agreed. Great, great. Um, okay, so now I have a question uh, for Tracy here. So what, what do you think the best way, uh, what do you think is the appropriate way to go and further cybersecurity objectives, especially around democracy and elections? Like, what is the right approach? Jeez. Here, there, handle that softball. That's a big, that's <laughs> a big question <laughs> for the insurance industry. Um, so, I, I mean, what we do have to, uh, we have, do have to start with uh, you know, having basic security at, at organizations, at, at our um, organizations, um, large companies and small companies. We see a lot of focus on best practices, certainly at the large company area, and a lot of focus in that area from regulators, but not a lot of attention being paid to uh, smaller organizations that are usually suppliers and, and network into larger organizations. And so um, we have to start building a full infrastructure that's just, that's more secure in, in every aspect. And um, in government needs to follow the, those rules too. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of leg legacy systems and, and, and things where we're not putting uh, basic um, good hygiene procedures in place. And we need to really start at that level uh, it's, it's still taking a long time to get some of those basic uh, procedures in place, and I think the lack of visibility on the small sector and holding uh, and 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 be, being able to see what's going on in that area, it's it's not strengthening the overall infrastructure. So I think we really need to start there. And we talked about education and best practices and <coughs> learning these things as you know as consumers and. And, um, and, our, and our children understanding what best practices are in good cyber hygiene. And so it really needs to start from the bottom in that way and, and building that up uh, so uh, we can have a more secure entire network. 
Great, great. From an election standpoint, I, I, I'm, I'm a, the problem is that it's a distributed system. The federal government doesn't handle elections in this country. It's a state's rights issue. And so each state has its own standards it's following. To Ed's point, please, Lord, NIST, you know, <laughs> make it, make one and make everybody, hold everybody to that same accountable standard and that's the starting of the process with basic hygiene in that process, but it's a still a distributed system, but it doesn't mean you have a distributed standard. You should have one single standard across and force everybody to use that. But there's also not the funding and the economic incentives to implement what needs to be done. And so I think you know, the economic incentives are important, um, and when it is up to the states, you know, they're, they're, you know, there's, there's other considerations. You don't have the resources and you don't have the funding and the economic incentives. Well, yeah, and, and an interesting point that was, that was brought up, I'll kind of ask as a question out there, but um, so there's a perception by many that the real damage and interference that happened during the election wasn't really related to breaking into a few state voter rolls and doing other things related to this that was directly a sort of cybersecurity thing that the state uh, board of, of elections would have been able to necessarily handle or address, that many of the issues actually came from, uh, as Ed was describing in his talk, the spread of disinformation on social media and other platforms. So um, to what extent should we be worried about these two um, different ways of influencing our elections? Yes, off. Well, being, being part of the press, Go ahead. being part of the yeah. press, um, it's nice to be a business that is constitutionally protected. So, <laughs> so, so the separation of the, uh, uh, to have that type of attitude, and for these now social media platforms to be, to be claiming um, uh, press, because that's their role, they still have an obligation for the integrity of the data that's being put out there. It's not the Wild West. We can control things, and I think uh, Facebook's latest announcements on how they're going to be tightening up uh, social media within their structure is a good first step to it, but it, it's not the end game yet. So I, I, I believe that what we have to do is continue down that path now to its logical conclusion. And it may, not have, it may be that we have to put in some restrictions and put in some controls, but it's necessary for the integrity of the data that we have. It, because it is a full system. We're talking about parties being broken into, we're talking about the ver various states, and we're talking about social media. It's in ever, every part of that system that we're talking about was impacted. And we have to look at it holistically across all of those. We can't just say, stay too tight, up your act, and everything else will, right. will be fine. Good point. I, I also think that aside from the, you know, that looking at the hacking or what was compromised, we have to look at the kind of the eroding of, of customer confidence. The, 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 the American people, if, if they believe, and they're reading the Intel reports, the joint Intel reports that come, came out that said with high confidence, Russia had an effect on the, on the 2016 election. Um, you know, you start to then question um, whether or not there was any active hacking and votes were, were messed with or voter registra registration was compromised. People are starting to question the validity of the campaign. And, and now you've got, you know, at least 18 other countries that have come forward and said that they believe that their campaigns have been affected as well. And some of those countries are now blocking certain sites and people going to those sites. So that is, you know, it's now, now we're affecting privacy and, and, and freedom of speech. Um, that, I think, the eroding of the, of the, of the confidence in the system is, is really where R Russia won. Ed? I have a point. When um, <clears throat> I was a little kid, my mother would take me with her to the bank. And when we went to the bank, the banker, like glasses on tip of the nose, would put a form in front of my mother or my dad. And I remember as a kid watching, they would take a pen and they would look very carefully at this form, like there was this grave act that was about to occur. And after conferring a little, my parents would discuss, they'd nod and they would sign the form, sign their name on the form. And I learned as a kid, that's a big deal, man, when you put your name on a form. Now fast forward and watch my kids signing up for accounts online and maybe they're not old enough to have a Facebook account, but they go, eh, it's a big deal. And they put Joe Schmo, age 50, where do I live? Yankee Stadium, Bronx, New York. Enter, and I go, you just put some nonsense on a form, and they go, eh, I don't care. And apparently a lot of social media, they don't care. And I think that's a problem. 
You know what I mean? We like talked about this at, in our prep you know, call. It's just yeah. wrong to put something wrong as a, as a, it just doesn't seem right to me. But it's more insidious than that. Uh, you know, if you talk about uh, bad guy motivations, right? There's crime, there's hacktivism, there's espionage, there's warfare, there's kind of mischief, okay? Terrorism, all right? This thing that's popped up now, cyber influence operations, okay? This is stuff that military has been doing for a year, but the commercial sector is just now realizing that it's possible. And it's not just that people are throwing lies out on social media. Uh, the Russians and other organizations have figured out how to put the two groups against each other with the lies they put out. It's not that they're just telling you a lie, but they are foaming resentment and trying to divide the country in twos and threes, right? And they're really good at this, okay? And uh, that's the stuff I'm worried about. And well, there's no answer for that right now because this is not a hacking attack. This is just throwing crap into the social media and watch it swirl. Okay, so that's, so you said there's no hope there, at least right now. Uh, <laughs> no right? hope. <laughs> Sorry, let's I didn't let's mean let's that to come out. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but let's say we wave a wand and we say there's a problem you can solve. Um, what, what, what's something that you think that with, you know, a good amount of time and investment, what's a good cyber moonshot? What's something we should aim for? Ah, uh, that's, for, that's for me? Yep. Um, I like, really like what Ed said, okay? If we're, you guys know about the cyber moonshot, the big JFK, put a man on the moon, bring him back safely, take 10 years to do that. If we do a cyber moonshot and say in 10 years, <coughs> we want to make the internet safe, not safer. Because I think since I started doing this back in the 90s, we've incrementally made it safer. But if you can think of the big things that you would do to make it safe, what would they be, right? Uh, one of the things that you did, I want to jump on the cyber core of education, yeah. that's got to be a pillar for that, right? Um, I totally support that. The other one I think is necessary is what you were saying about signing. I think there needs to be a digital signature for everybody in the world, all right? So we can absolutely prove that you sent that crap on Facebook, right? And we know it's you, and it's not Joe from, you know, uh, New York City or uh, Yankee Stadium in the Bronx or whatever. Great. Yeah. Those are two, okay. Um, well, okay, so at this point, we'll uh, now start taking questions from the audience. Yes, please. Um, I'm going to sound kind of mean to your grandmother, but assignment of liability, uh, we're in a situation, I'm sorry, uh, we're in a situation where we have nothing but victims and a few bad actors, and yet the grandmother who leaves her computer on where it is infected and is being used as a tool to commit all of these bad things is perceived as a victim. Uh, companies that are used as gateways into third parties are perceived as victims. At what, what would change if we started assigning liability and fines in the way that, say, HIPAA compliance is required or the SEC fines large corporations? Would your grandmother turn that computer off, thereby not be a uh, tool for uh, cyber warfare effectively? I mean, I think another another thing to look at is 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 you know, um, if you if you get your uh, credit card stolen and someone in Wisconsin you know buys five hundred dollars at Walmart and and you're not um, you you prove that you didn't do it you're going to get refunded for it right it's the same thing is if they stop doing that and now you're responsible for your identity being stolen it's the same thing. I, I have an opinion. I think. You're right about turning the computer off. That's um, an obvious thing. You know how in, uh, in a room like this, you probably would have, a, would have a hard time electrocuting yourself, right? Like you, you would have to go up to one of the wall sockets and Rick and I would have to take like two metal prongs and, <laughs> and, a, and some water. I could do go, it. I'm boom, sure and put the it. water on it. Ah, <laughs> get zapped, right? And if we do that, then it's kind of our fault. Like, we couldn't call the building manager and go, you're in an unsafe room. We put two metal prongs in and pour it. The guy would say, what are you, crazy? So I think computing right now, if we could get to the point where my mother, my grandmother, whoever, has to really do something kind of stupid to get hacked, then I think that's reasonable. But where we are right now, it would be like you're sitting here and you shift in your seat and you get electrocuted. Like it's just completely unreasonable 
to ask my mother to be a Unix system of machine. You, you guys all know yeah. Marcus Raynham? Mm -hmm. yep. He said something I memorized. And, and Marcus once in a while says something smart to memorize. <laughs> he said, and I quote, he said, the tragedy of modern computing is that we've turned every man, woman, and child into a Windows system administrator. <laughs> and that is true, right? Like my mother shouldn't have to do this thing. Turn the thing on and use it. And then whether you turn it on or turn it off, like if she leaves the TV on, it doesn't put the whole house at risk. You know, they don't start a cyber war because the TV's left on. You like to sleep with the TV on. Although now those are computers, so maybe it does. But you get the point. It has to be reasonable. There has to be a contract with the user that here's some obvious things you shouldn't do, but we're going to make sure that it's not you do something that seems okay and you put the nation at risk. That, that's where we are now. Mm -hmm. So in principle, I agree, but I think the, it, it's still too much work to, for my mother. It's not fair. Can I throw that so out as, as something your students should do? Does? Yeah, yeah. There's been not enough work to make security stuff easy to use, right? There's lots of really smart people like you, engineers, that have designed really cool stuff, but only you know PhDs in cybersecurity can actually make it work. We've had... PGP encryption around since I was a young lad, and most people are not smart enough to use it because it's too complicated, right? So put some brain power in making that stuff easy to use so we can all benefit from it. Well, we have. It's okay. the paradigm, we have the paradigm of the iPad. You know, um, candidly, I've moved my entire family over to iPads. Why? Because I'm no longer the help desk. You know, it was probably my biggest relief of phone calls in the middle of meetings from the home saying the printer doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. You know, it is simple and easy to use and far more secure in the way that it's being used instead of taking now an old laptop out of the box, knowing what to do with it, how to configure it, and, and then keeping it up to date. The iPad just, it should be, you take it out of the consumer's hands and the consumer is safer when they don't know what they don't know. And the I, the iPad government. fixes the printer, doesn't work by getting rid of the printer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to point out, though, that uh, companies are liable. I mean, you have major hacks, CEOs are fired, CISOs are fired, you've got GDPR, 4% fines for global revenue, you've got fine, all different fines that we have in the United States. So, I mean, there are, there are punishments for, uh, for not having good security, um, but, you know, that's, not, that's definitely not solving the problem. I, I, I don't know that, that it has. Okay, uh, so with the mic here. Bob Gazelter, I was gonna question whether we can, whether the question, the question that came up in this first question was can the network be made safe? And I question if that is, is equivalent to censorship because there's certainly here, it might be at the present time that the government does not consider safety to be a freedom of press issue but I can name half a dozen regimes in the, on this planet who would consider publication to be regulatable, and that would instantly turn it into the, the question, the philosophical question of is there truth? I'm sure um, certain gentlemen in Eastern Europe slash Asia would state many things as truth that we might challenge. And so, if we just said to make it safe, we therefore basically turn the internet into a propaganda machine. Well, that's not what I had in mind. <laughs> I, I understand that. <laughs> I'm not saying you did. I'm just saying the problem of anonymous speech is the problem of anonymous speech, but the alternative is you disappear your ability to speak if your government turns around and says no. Well, we can go down a rabbit hole on this. I'm just saying that when you do official transactions, Okay, you should, we should be know who you are. There should be a spot on the internet where you can go wild, wild west and be anonymous, and you can be Joe from the Bronx, right? Because when I'm playing World of Warcraft, I don't want them to know that you know, I'm the chief security officer from Palo Alto Networks, right? So there should be two, okay? Uh, but uh, if I'm doing an official transaction, I should absolutely know who well, that person is. That's the point. Should there be two? Are we moving to that? Yeah. Anonymity implies non-trust. I mean, do you trust anybody that's anonymous on the internet? So the internet was based or was designed on a trust relationship that is no longer valid. You know, the little few professors that are out there, I, I was one of the early users of the internet, and, and it was a large, giant, trusted network. It's no longer that. So is it time to change the paradigm and say, okay, we'll have a trust and an untrust? Should we have two internets to 
allow people to voice their opinions and you take it for what it's worth, and then a business-related one or a one in which commerce can be adequately protected um, and commerce can take place free in a trusted environment. Okay, yeah. so I, I'm going to read out an online question. Uh, this is in response to Ed's uh, letter to Trump. Uh, the gist of the question is, is that reliance on inter enterprise security is bad. They agree with this. However, most of the significant cyber breaches for the government agencies have to do with malicious insiders and poor access management. I assume they're thinking things like OPM and other breaches like yeah. that. How would you address those areas? Oh, well, here's an example. When you build a big perimeter and you trust everybody on the inside, then being an insider rocks, right? Because <laughs> your physical proximity in that network is awesome. I'm in and I can see everything. That's a really good way to do it. Let's say the food service vendor here at NYU comes in through a portal and puts menus here for the kids to see how much they're you know, gonna enjoy or not enjoy dinner tonight, right? So the food service vendor comes in to see the whole network. Question, what do they need to get on the network for that? Well, why don't you throw that up in the cloud? Put in a workload up in the cloud, keep it away from your perimeter. Kids can go up and see it on their iPads. They go up in the iPads, you're not touching the perimeter. If you believe that, then carry that to its logical extreme for everything. So and then you have no more perimeter, you have no more insider. So I'm gonna to try to channel the, the questioner for a second here, but uh, think for instance about uh, the Snowden case, where he was someone who was effectively- Insider. An insider. He was, he, was, he was an authorized person by the rules and policies they had in place mm -hmm. to be able to access those systems. So how do you defend against those? Compartmentalization. I mean, that's, that's the way it always worked when I first started doing this. You segment, you break up the thing into pieces. I mean, the, the okay. Right, I mean, is that, that's what you guys it's, would do. I would say that it's easy to say to do that. It's also really hard to do. It's hard to do. Yeah. Right, because we all have done this, right? Uh, here's Joe, he's really smart, and I need him to fix that machine, and that machine, and that machine. Oh, he's got to log in in three different administrator accounts, and it's just a pain in the rear end, so I'll just give him super admin and let him go. I mean, you know, have you all done that? I've done that. Right? And, 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 and the reality to prevent the next 9 11, so you right. have all the databases be all linked together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People will be able to see yeah. everything, yeah. which is. Yeah, a lot NIST asks you not to do yeah. that, right? right. The 800 Sorry, so control no, and say, awesome. segregate that. Yep. And, and the reality, you know, if, we, if you look at the insider, it's either the, the witting or the unwitting. The witting, the, the reality is, is most companies out there have one head of IT, they're responsible for everything, they've got admin for everything, all systems, they're the ones with the passwords, they're the single point of failure. And then the unwitting is, you know, I've seen um, companies that spend, you know, half a billion dollars a year on, on, uh, on, on, on cybersecurity get compromised because someone in their tax department gets, gets fished and they're an unwitting insider. So it's massive issues boiling down to that we're still not practicing the basic tenets of cybersecurity, two-factor authentication and still using those one, two, three, four, five, six passwords. Can I have one more thing about Insider? I, I, I'm, a, I'm always on the uh, minority in this one, right? So you guys will probably disagree with me, right? But I take umbrage with the fact that the CISO is in charge of Insider threat, okay? The Insiders already have access to all the systems, right? Uh, I have nothing to do with that. I can run some automation maybe, maybe see some weird activity, right? But that's an HR problem. That is a CEO problem, right? That has to be a whole, f yeah. process problem inside that you should be looking for insiders uh, and people should have a reporting mechanism and all that and that's really hard to do mm -hmm. right but that's not a CISO problem I'm trying to keep bad guys from coming in from the outset. Mm -hmm. Fair right. point. Okay I think we have a question gentlemen with the microphone there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with more IOTs um, should uh, security defects in the product be a product liability and would that be covered by insurance? for consequential damages. We all swivel to the insurance lady. Well, <laughs> software is the only industry where you don't have that, right? right. I mean, the, it's really the only industry where we can buy something that we all agree is probably not right and that we all agree to patch on our own and we sign something when we click on I accept that more or less says we understand that the product we're using doesn't work. We all know that, Every, it's not a big secret. Um, that's been discussed for 20 years, it's not gonna change. So uh, whether you go on one side of it or the other, um, it strikes me as a moot issue. I don't, I don't think the software industry is ever going to be 
in some sense held accountable for bugs. And it may be because software engineering, in a practical sense, is still too new. And even if we demanded that the software be right, I, I'm not sure we have the technology to even do it. So I, 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 in the, earlier in my career, I used to make a big fuss about that. I've stopped because I think it's a, it, it's not a, it doesn't get us to, to the right place. I think the right question is, how can we make software engineering into a more legitimate engineering discipline? And a place, like NYU, is, this is where we start, right? To make it, you know, so that engineering becomes something. You're shaking your head. Disagree? What do you, well, go, let's hear. What's that? Slowly. How do we move to autonomous cars? No, I, I, Yeah, there's going to be software problems. But we have 30,000 people who die on highways today. So the metric is not against perfect, it's against where you are now. So if with autonomous cars, with all the software bugs and whatever, I can get down to 3,000 people killed because of software bugs, would you take that deal? Yeah, and I'll, and I'll just to... Uh, uh, I'll make one last comment and then we'll move on to the next question, which is actually anything you can do by hacking into an autonomous car, you can do today by hacking into a car that doesn't have those cameras and those safety systems built into it. So, um, you know, the, the cars that we have today, many experts who look at this area believe are not necessarily going to be any more insecure. They'll have more code in them, but they'll also have systems in them that are meant to try to stop you from running into pedestrians and running into the median and doing all the other things that are in very primitive stages today. Okay, who, where's the other microphone at? Right here. Okay, so please, uh, questions. Um, yeah, well, actually, most of the people preempted my questions. Uh, actually, so the, the, I was, there was a statement that was made that we made the internet safer. Um, to me, it feels like the internet has gotten more and more complex, right? And we've introduced a lot of securities by layering on different libraries, different vendors, different, every interaction between those, uh, those different components becomes a vulnerability. And so I was wondering, like, is it really possible to secure an infrastructure that you've built on the ground, from the ground up as a trusted network, uh, as opposed to just, like was mentioned here, basically separate out the two and because I, I just don't see how you would stop someone like uh, you know, China or Russia if they have access to a node, and they do because of the nature of the web, they're able to see it. And you can't prevent denial of service attacks unless you're Google and you've got Google Shield or something. It's impossible, like considering the size of the IoT sort of DDoSs that we're seeing today, to actually prevent that. So how, like, is the only solution to really put together a secure system is to separate out the two, to have a uh, secure internet, you know, for commerce and for national infrastructure, yeah, no. as opposed to, you know, email and things like that? No, I, here's the biggest misconception that the public has about cybersecurity. We always worry about the thing at the end, okay, the compromise at the end point, because that's the sexy thing that gets the news. What we fail to realize when we do that is bad guys have to accomplish a, a series of steps. To, a comp to break into a network, all the way down the cyber kill chain, okay? And we can put prevention controls at every one of those stops. Ed talked about this at the beginning of his speech, right? We have, every time we put another prevention control at a different stage of the cyber kill chain, it raises our chances of stopping a bad guy from getting in, right? So yeah, there may be a vulnerability at the end, and there may be a vulnerability over here, but if you can capture all the things we know about all the adversaries, and by the way, we know most of them. We know 99% of what goes on on, from adversaries today. Our failure is that we are not able to put the prevention controls in place to stop them. But again, it's also, you have to look at it from an internet, uh, from the network standpoint. Um, I think Gene Spafford, we have SSL, UTSL, we have multiple locate, multiple encryption technologies that secure points from, from endpoint to endpoint. And using those technologies is, is largely akin to using an armored car to um, Gene Spafford said, uh, using an armored car to, uh, to transfer a ham sandwich between two guys living in, in, in cardboard boxes. You know, it's not the network that's insecure. The network can be made secure. We can make it secure, and it is secure. We have a thing called the, right now today called the DOTUS network, the highly uh, classified network that the military uses. It's largely secure. The infrastructure uh, penetrations that have occurred have occurred at the endpoints, at the databases, at the things that are, that are largely unprotected, the cardboard boxes that we all don't like to talk about, and we try to blame the internet for things that the internet is doing just fine. It's the people and processes and technologies at the endpoints that cause the problems. 
And that's what you can't trust. Mike, Mike. Okay. Uh, it built that stuff, IBM. Uh, could, could, you, could somebody, anybody, uh, talk a little bit about what uh, happens, you know, every six weeks when we uh, are driving home and we hear that uh, some set of websites are under attack and crashing, uh, and, and across the next 36 hours there's coverage of it that diminishes, and, and I guess it's all fixed at the end. <laughs> but could, could you talk about the, uh, how the, the tools and techniques for figuring out what, what's <coughs> happening and the remediation that goes on and, and what kind of detritus is left around at the end? That's another big one. Basic hygiene, Tracy said it, basic hygiene is really hard. You know, it, it, if, if you start with Ed's premise, if you started today and started doing something today, you build secure systems and you can build a secure environment. None of us have the luxury of that environment. We all have legacy environments that are monetized and they're doing their job just fine. They're highly insecure, but they're doing their job just fine. And convincing businesses to make the investment to replace those systems is an uphill battle. And we battle it every day. I was talking to someone today and they said, you know, CISO, it's, a, it's not a sales job. And I'm like, you don't understand the CISO roller. Because that's all we do, is we do sales over and over and over and over. We're trying to convince people to do the right thing in the environment. But, you know, the public pronouncements of breaches, I think the only thing that's changed with uh, California and all the subsequent state laws that have uh, come out is there's now awareness of it. It's made our jobs a whole lot easier. We used to talk about the good old days when things were just hidden under the carpet. We all knew it was going on, but nobody talked about it. Nobody had statistics. Nobody had the infrastructure to be able to tell people how bad it was. But it's, it's now we just have the visibility into it. Mm -hmm. and now everybody knows how bad it is. I'll give you another two p cents on that, too. Uh, there's the things the CISOs do before an incident that's a an actual breach, all the prevention things that you're supposed to be doing. And then when you get breached, okay, that's another set of things that you have to be able to, be, to do. Other things, other entities in the company kick in, right? And if you look at some of the latest big breaches we've had this last year, it appears that the executives have never practiced that, okay? Their message to the world is, it seems like we're making it up as we go, right? And actually practicing incident response, actually practicing what you're gonna tell the public if this bad thing happens is something that your organization needs to do and be good at. Every time. Okay, we'll take another, um question from online here. So what sorts of standards should we institute for software companies? Right now there's no real fine or penalty being imposed on tech companies for writing bad code. It's maybe a reputational hit. Um, what, should there be something that happens at a governmental or another level to try to mitigate this? I think that fining people when they make mistakes is a bad idea, first off. Like the idea that um, there's a mistake, there's an error, there's a hack, and you're going to be fined. I, the only time that ever makes sense to me is if there's a clear way you could have avoided it and you didn't. But when we develop software now, we were joking before, anything that calls itself a science is not one. So computer science is not a science. We don't have repeatable experiments. We don't have principles that we follow that if followed will build, lead to robust engineered systems, right? I mean, uh, civil engineering is built on top of physics. So the idea that software engineering is built on top of computer science is flawed because computer science is not a science. So it, it just seems unfair to me at this point it, where software has been around for 40 or 50 years, which is not as long as physics or chemical engineering, or it isn't even a thousand years or longer, um, I think we have to live with it. I think we have to figure out how to make software engineering into a real engineering practice, and we have to turn computer science into computing and make it a real scientific discipline where the engineering is built on something real. But right now it's not. So it just seems to me unfair to beat up software engineers because it just it's not an engineering practice and it's not built on top of science. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're getting the there. Yes, uh, Frank Sissio with IQ4. So workforce, um, Ed, you mentioned um, CyberCorp before. 
So we know that there's about 200 plus thousand jobs right now open in cybersecurity. We know there'll be probably about 3 million plus by 2021. Mm. Um, we also have the NICE framework, right? The yeah. NCWF framework. NICE framework. We know that cyber is very complex, much more complex on the uh, competencies and those areas. So what is the panel's thoughts on, um, in terms of the workforce, uh, you know, we're going to spend, what, a trillion dollars over the next three or four years on technology, but we need people to operate it. We need people to build it. We need not just technology, but we have governance, risk, compliance, human behavior, analytics, communications, right? So what are your thoughts on um, what do we need to do to address the workforce here in this room, our young people, in a multidisciplined way? I, I'll, I'll start just real simple is that I have, I, have, I have kids and, uh, and all of my kids uh, had the choice in high school in their senior year whether or not to take a math or science. I just think that's ridiculous, right? <laughs> to, to give, it, it should be mandatory uh, all the way up through they've finished schooling regardless of what they're doing. And I think that's, that's the first building block is that we need to emulate some other nations who are, who are starting kids in, in, in math and sciences, you know, when they learn how to read. Uh, and, and, you know, I, when I hire somebody in my company, uh, I, I, I rarely look at where they graduate, I rarely look at their, their GPA. What I'm looking for is experience. And, and, I, and if we don't close that gap, so if they're, not, if they're not thinking about math and sciences at an early age, by the time we get them into a cybersecurity program or start training them in the core, they're already behind the power curve, right? Um, I think that's, for me, the, the first step. Well, let, me, let me throw some stats at you, okay, because uh, we're missing a whole population of people we can throw at filling this gap. Uh, women in our industry, in the tech industry, okay, 30%, okay, in the cybersecurity industry, it's 14%. If you add an adjective to that, like being black or Hispanic, it's under 1%. Okay, if we have any hope of filling that, man, that was going to be a good point. Too. Didn't like your answer. Stop that guy. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll see if we can get back to it in a second. Incident response. Change of battery. <laughs> So if we, uh, speak, speak, speak. <laughs> Are we okay? Should Those we hackers. Go? <laughs> okay. Everybody. So, sorry, people. Uh, let's make our way. Thanks for coming. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you. Oh, it's a cool way to end the yeah. panel. Right?